Welcome, welcome everyone <coughs> to this evening a conversation with Thomas Wenzlava and uh, the Minister of Culture of Lithuania, Mindaugas Kitkauskas, Professor Samuel Sujedlis, Rabbi Andrew Baker, and I will be the moderator of that. We are terribly pleased. Uh, can this be? Can this sound be improved? It's fine? Okay. Um, we are terribly pleased at EVO uh, to be holding this, uh, this, this evening, which is part of uh, Litvak Days, uh, sponsored by the Lithuanian Consulate uh, here in New York, for the promotion and for the serious discussion of Jewish life in Lithuania. Uh, I can think of no better uh, person to begin this conversation than Thomas Venslava, who to me is truly representative of the spirit of what used to be Europe. Europe as it was once conceived. Europe as a unity of the spiritual life of, of the nations who inhabited that region. A spiritual life that was built on fundamental principles of justice, of tolerance, of equality, of understanding and of critical, critical living. It is a spirit which seems to have passed from our midst. But in Thomas, we see it. In the work, in his poetry, in his, in his, in his essays, in his teaching, and so we are so honored and pleased to have him on the stage with us tonight. And before I call the, the, the members of our discussion up to the stage, I want to welcome the uh, Acting Consul General of Lithuania to say some words uh, of, of welcome. Gitana uh, Skirpanti. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Labas vakaras ponios ir ponu. I am pleased, pleased to welcome you all at the first Litvak dates in New York. And I would like to especially to thank uh, Mindaugas Kvietkauskas, the Minister of Culture of the Republic of Lithuania, Professor Thomas Wenslovas, Professor Solus Sujedis, and true friends of Lithuania, Rabbi Andrew Baker and Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Brent, the Executive Director of EVO, for being with us this evening. The fact that this event is organized at EVO is very important. And we highly value the long-lasting partnership with EVO and we do hope that the Litvak days in New York will give us an opportunity to foster the ties between Jewish, American, and Lithuanian communities, linking intellectual dialogue, promoting mutual understanding and tolerance. The Litvak legacy is an integral part of Lithuania's rich history and culture. Some pages of our history are extremely painful. Therefore, we must constantly remember them and to realize what we have lost in the past while making efforts to identify, cherish, and pass the Litvak heritage to our future generations. There are many Litvaks living in New York who feel emotionally attached to Lithuania. And one of the aims of this event is to encourage Litvak community to look back at their historic homeland. In addition, we call on the Lithuanian community to better understand their Litvak identity and culture, as well as their deep ties with Lithuania lasting almost 700 years. I do hope 
that the Litvak days in New York will serve as a bridge connecting past, present, and future. Thank you very much for coming, and I look forward for a compelling discussion this evening. Thank you. So now I would like to uh, welcome uh, uh, Professor Venslova to come and speak for maybe 20 minutes, and then we will have our discussion. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, um, well, first of all, I was unprepared uh, for the fact that I uh, am expected to give a f sort of a formal speech. But thankfully, I have with me the text I presented yesterday at Hunter College. <laughs> so, yes. Some of you may have heard it, uh, some of you may, may not. There will be some differences. It will be shorter than in Hunter College. Uh, there, uh, there, there it took f f approximately 50 minutes. Now I hope it will take around 20 minutes. Because I just expected that we will have a common discussion without any formal speeches. But well, if necessary, let me do it. So, so um, 44 years ago, I wrote an essay called Jews and Lithuanians. It first appeared in the Jewish underground press in the Soviet Union, later in Israel, and still later it was translated and published by Lithuanian emigres here in the United States. The essay caused a bit of a stir in the emigre community. Several uh, Lithuanian cultural figures uh, told me they agreed with what I wrote and were uh, ready to put their signatures under my text. But there were responses from the opposite side as well, although mostly anonymous or, or pseudonymous. I was still in Lithuania then, um, but already a dissident contributing to the underground press, and I left to two years later. That was in the year 1977. The text I wrote was dedicated to my daughter, whose name is Maria, or in Lithuanian, Maritia. Uh, she was two years old then. Uh, Maria is Jewish on her mother's side, and her mother, incidentally, is Jewish only on her mother's side. Uh, on my side, um, Maria is Lithuanian, as I am, am and uh, she is Christian, she was baptized. But I thought that when she grew up, it might be important to her to understand what happened between her two peoples. So what has changed over 44 years, and what has not? I'll begin with my daughter. She is, she is now 46, uh, living in Florida, in Boca Raton, a mother herself now, and she considers herself an American and a Lithuanian. She visited Lithuania more than once, and uh, has a double citizenship, American and Lithuanian. She has never been to Israel, but she knows a fair deal about the Holocaust, as many Americans do. I never asked her whether my essay meant anything to her. I even don't know did she read, the, read it or not. But we never discussed it at all. So if we go to the heart of the matter in the essay, in that old essay. What really stands out is that Lithuanians at that time, including me, knew pra practically nothing about Jewish history in Lithuania. The textbooks of independent Lithuania between the two world wars, 
dedicated at most a half page to Jews. The authors were only concerned with ethnic Lithuanians, well, also with Poles. But Poles were, according to the official view at, of that time, either Lithuanians who had lost their ethnic identity, or treacherous enemies, or both. Uh, Soviet textbooks uh, did not mention Jews at all. The word itself seemed profane somehow, and it was avoided. There was some writing about the mass murders during the war, but suppressing or attempting to suppress the fact that, that the victims were mainly Jews. On the other hand, ethnic Lithuanians usually inter interpreted Soviet propaganda uh, contrarily. That means if the regime, and especially the KGB, said, said something, the truth had to be diametrically exact opposite of that. If the so-called Borges nationalists were being denounced and accused, that meant all of them down to each and every individual were heroes and freedom fighters. It was only the very rare person who understood that this made you dependent upon the KGB, because the KGB was determining your concept of history if only in a very perverse and roundabout manner. Well, although it is painful to admit it, even the most horrible organizations, including the KGB, and the most horrible forces, sometimes also tell the truth, at least partially. So not all among those attacked by the Soviets were genuine heroes and freedom fighters. Uh, an apologetic approach to 1941 dominated, with certain small exceptions, in the emigre community. Uh, now, not only do we have rather detailed information on Jewish topics in general Lithuanian history studies, but there are also a large number of rather fundamental books on the legacy and past of Lithuanian Jews. And the great stratum of the Litva culture is no longer alien to, ethnic Litu to many ethnic Lithuanians. If it has not been integrated into Lithuanian culture, I believe the foundation for doing so has already been laid. There are many exhibits, for example, which touch upon Jewish Vilnius or Vilna. And by no means are these exhibits exclusively by Jewish artists. It appears there is real and sincere interest in, in this. For me, at least, it's sad that there was not enough funding, or more likely it was a lack of sufficient will, to buy Mark Chagall's painting on the Vilna Synagogue for the Lithuanian Museum, which was possible. Well, it was expensive, of course, but not too expensive uh, for today's Lithuania. The Vilna Gaon has become an as inaliable a part of the multi-ethnic heritage of Vilnius as the Grand Duke de Minas, uh, founder of the city, or the great Polish poet Adam Mickiewicz, who lived in the city, or for that matter, Czeslaw Milos, who also lived in the city and like Mickiewicz graduated from, Vil from Vilnius University. The late uh, Jewish writer Itzhok Asmeras, who wrote in Lithuanian language, and uh, the living Grigorius Kanovichus, or Grigory Kanovich, uh, who lives in Israel and writes in Russian on Lithuanian topics, have been recognized as part of Lithuanian culture. And there are a number of usually successful films and plays centered on the topic of the past and the fate of the Jews. Many martyrological memoirs have been published, and the situation of the Jews during the Nazi occupation is no longer hushed up. The attempt is being made to make it a part of public memory. Neither are the actions, actions of Lithuanian Nazis being kept quiet, all talk only on a very abstract level. Any accusation leveled at a specific person is still usually labeled slander and the KGB invention. 
No most, most of those uh, persons uh, have already passed away. The Vilna Ghetto is being restored. Uh, there are memorial plaques and statues there. Uh, I hold out hope that uh, the great synagogue will be rebuilt. In my um, essay 44 years ago, I wrote that the ghetto sections were being restored during the Soviet period in such a way so that no one would remember they were Jewish. And that was our national shame. Now this is no longer true. I would like also to say that a large and good Jewish museum, such as in Berlin and Warsaw, is really needed in Vilnius and I'll also have some hope um, this will happen. So um, there is a, at present a Jewish uh, museum in Vilnius, but it is rather small and uh, rather neglected, I would say. In my uh, essay, I wrote that Jews and Lithuanians for many decades interacted as did the Mar Martians and Erklings arrivals from Earth on Mars in a story by Ray, Ray Bradbury. They lived in different spaces. And when they did meet, it was the consequence of rare and lucky coincidence. This is probably also no longer true. Lithuanians and Jews are no longer separate wolves who never cross paths. There is some interest in Judaism, its theological, philosophical, and philological tradition. Uh, in the Judaic respect for knowledge. All of this have, has become uh, even fashionable in certain Lithuanian circles. Lithuanian novels have appeared which attempt to deal fairly with Lithuanian role in and relationship to the Holocaust, for example, by Sigita Sparulskis. Um, Catholic priests have stepped forward whose views of the Holocaust are beyond any criticism, whose, whose views on the Holocaust are perfectly honest and correct. Julius Osnauskas is an example of, of uh, that. This is, however, more of an elite affair, and in general, amnesia holds court regarding not just the Jewish, but also the Lithuanian past. In the, my essay, I wrote that we have lived together for 600 years, and that perhaps the time is drawing to a close. At such a moment, we cannot be enemies or unconcerned with, with, an, uh, with an, uh, another. Happily, that period of living together has not drawn to a close. Although the number of uh, Jewish uh, people in Lithuania is very small now, I think around 3,000 3, persons at all. Before the war, it was more than 200,000. Um, but there are still living people, such as Irene Weisaitie, or the late Leonidas Donskis, or also the late uh, Alexandra Stromas, who are exerting a significant uh, influence. They are both Jews and Lithuanians, or Lithuanians of Jewish origin incarnating in their persons the very idea of civic Lithuanians. Uh, th this means Lithuania is moving into the ranks of normal states, because such people are an everyday occurrence in uh, normal countries. There are also still pe there still are also people who stress their loyalty to the Judaic tradition, and it is a very good thing that there are such people. In, in the essay, I wrote that we, ma we Lithuanians must understand the destruction of the Jews is our own destruction. The dehumanization of the Jews is our own dehumanization. And the liquidation of Jewish culture, which happened during the Soviet period, is an attempt on the life of our own culture. Has this become an axiom which the ma majority of Lithuanians accept? Unfortunately, I don't think so. Not only has anti-Semitism not disappeared, and its absolute disappearance apparently is an impossibility, it seemingly it contains something metaphysical in its nature, it rather frequently erupts in public spaces. 
Sociolog sociological studies show that the function of scapegoat, the tradition of the least liked group, has been assumed from the Jews, for, by the Roma or Gypsies, by blacks, by Muslims, by homosexuals, and people with mental disabilities. But it is truly called comfort because latent hatred of the other still exists in Lithuania. In moments of crisis, it may manifest itself as deed, and unfortunately, there is a possibility that those deeds will begin to follow the old pattern again. People often get the impression that Lithuanian Jewish relations up till 1940 or 1941 were ideal. This was not the case. Perhaps they were somewhat better than in many neighboring countries, some uh, probably better than in Poland or Ukraine for that matter. But they were still marked by estrangement and alienation. Our folklore and the classic writings, uh, not of all writers, of course, but some of them, and well known among them, contain some anti-Semitism. Lithuanians do not differ from other nations in this regard, because Dostoevsky and uh, Richard Wagner were, all, uh, were also an anti-Semites. Well, this is, of course, very disgusting, but before the Holocaust, I think it did not make such people into enemies of humanity. I think that Wagner, or especially Dostoevsky, or our own writers, would have been completely horrified by the Holocaust. But at the same time, they contributed to recreating the atmosphere in which the Holocaust became possible. The Lithuanian discourse at its concerns itself with the Holocaust, though still has gaps, to put it mildly. Because the ethnic nationalism remains the entrenched paradigm of the state ideology. Almost all figures in the Lithuanian 19th century national movement created this paradigm, including all uh, honorable people for whom streets and squares are named and for whom statues are erected, including Simonas Daukant as a, historical, uh, as a historian, Jonas Basinavichus, also Antanas Metona, the president of the independent Lithuania. The still popular history, written in the interwar period by Adolphus Shapoka, um, is still based on this paradigm. Post-war guerrillas or partisans and almost all emigres adhere to it. During Soviet times, ethnic nationalism was of a dual na nature. It was in no way, uh, no way alien to many communists and I ideologues of the official persuasion. According to this paradigm, the ethnic Lithuanian, excluding certain traitors who should not properly be called Lithuanians, may be only either an innocent victim or a heroic fighter or both. The Lithuanian always has been and always will be surrounded, according to that paradigm, by enemies whose passionate and the only desire is to desecrate and destroy Lithuanian ethnic identity, and, and usually a Lithuanian person, a Lithuanian individual as well. All acts by ethnic Lithuanians, according to that paradigm, are justified because they are necessarily self-defense and cannot be anything else. So the multicultural perspective and multicultural policies arrived in Lithuania from outside after entering the European Union. They had virtually no local roots. For this reason, many say with joy that policy, that policy had bankrupted Europe. Although I think this sort of talk is largely a, a, an exaggeration. Multiculturalism has entered into academia, but has not entered into the masses, nor into the ma majority of those in power who represent the thinking, so, the thinking of the masses. Globalization taken generally is considered evil by many and many. 
in Lithuania, even a treacherous conspiracy against ethnic identity. This ideology is not too distant, for example, from the ideology of Marine Le Pen in France. The difference is that almost all strong political forces in Lithuania support it. There is a consensus. So officially, it is agreed that the Holocaust is a great evil. A special day is allocated for remembering it. But at the same time, there still is, or until the very last days it was, there still was, the official attempt to justify and even canonize people who were complicit in the Holocaust. Commemorations and memorial plaques were dedicated to them. So this should be called a form of national and state schizophrenia. And this is what, what causes justified consternation and anger among Jews and am among more enlightened Lithuanians. Uh, now, that does not contribute to Lithuanian standing in the world. It does not contribute positively to Lithuania's image, and this is not a secret to anybody. None of this, as it's of, often claimed, presents a they say a different Jewish and Lithuanian narrative. That means a contradiction between two ethnic or national views. No, this is a conflict between an honest and fair view and a dishonest one. This is not a crossroads where Jews and Lithuanians part ways. It is a crossroads at the heart of the Lithuanian society. Well, uh, I ended this uh, short essay I am now presented with the sentence, the land est Cartago. Uh, well, there are two uh, Cartagos which should be destroyed, uh, in my opinion, and not only in my opinion. The first is the cult of the so-called 19. 41 June uprising and the provisional government which tried to uh, lead this uprising. I wrote about that 44 years ago, and since that time, having gained more information, my opinion of that uprising and that provisional government has only declined. Antisemitism was part of their program. There is no possibility and no reason to, to hide it. And the tragic consequence of that absolutely, of that absolutely annul anything this government supposedly achieved. If we call the events of June of 1941 the beginning of honorable resistance, as Vitutas Landsbergis, for example, uh, do, uh, does, we place a large black blemish on all of it, including the justified post-war Lithuanian anti-Soviet resistance. These events should not be given honor in the textbooks. It must be said clearly that from the very st start, the orientation to Hitler's Germany was a grave error and was totally unacceptable. At best, the Lithuanian in insurgents were naive at worst, there were many criminals among them. So the attempt is being made, or was being made, officially to sit on different chairs at once. The leaders of that movement, with a definitely Nazi component in, in their views and their behavior, such as Skirp and Tamprasevichus, uh, are um, discussed in this way. Uh, perhaps they made some slight mistakes, but essentially worked for the good of the country and therefore deserve respect. I mm, propose a very uncomfortable but uh, obvious and apt parallel, the official position of today's Putin's Russia regarding Stalin. So he might have destroyed a bit more people than, uh, than necessary, but he worked for the good of his country and therefore deserves the respect of the Russians. 
So such uh, logic is absolutely unacceptable for any Lithuanian. But uh, speaking about their own past, Lithuanians follow the same kind of logic. So the attitude spreads among us without utterance. We mark the Holocaust because the international situation demands it. But we mark our Lithuanian heroes of 1941 because our national honor demands it. Sorry? I did not uh, hear it. Sorry. So, um, in my opinion, this demonstrates the pathetic state of thinking in our society. To express regret over the Holocaust and to express honor and respect to the provisional government at the very same time is squaring the circle. There is no way to solve this antinomy. And it is not fitting, not appropriate to maintain any illusions regarding the issue. So at present, something started to change, especially after the recent uh, elections. Uh, seemingly, I hope so, yes, it seems that the new president, Gitanas Nauseda, the new mayor of Vilnius, have correct attitude to that problem and don't try anymore squaring the circle. Um, the two memorial signs to those pro-Nazi fighters were removed recently in Vilnius. But as some of you may, may, may have known, there was a manifestation today in Vilnius demanding uh, restoring the honor of place to our heroes. Uh, I think it will meet an adequate response of Lithuanian government and of Vilnius uh, um, society. And they are, it is rather marginal, only around 200 people uh, persons took part in that manifestation. But it, but it took, took place. Well, one probably cannot forbid such, such things in a democratic country, but I am rather happy that it was, uh, that it looked, still looks rather marginal phenomenon. I think we will sp speak more about that uh, today, about this, um, those memory wars, so to speak. The second uh, Cartago was the theory of the double or symmetrical genocide, that Lithuanians also, also experienced genocide, just like Jews. Uh, and the anti-Semites uh, used, to, used to say, because of the Jews. So um, this is a wrong theory. Um, because uh, that was not genocide, in, in, yes, yes, strictly speaking, that was stratocide. That was destruction of the Lithuanian elite, but not of Lithuania as an ethnic group. And this, this is a big difference. This is a big difference. So it was reflected, among other things, calling the KGB Museum in Vilnius the muse Museum of Genocide. When people came to that museum, expecting, of course, uh, some knowledge of Jewish genocide, they found uh, only the so-called genocide of ethnic Lithuanians under the Soviet regime. So I um, proposed uh, some years ago to rename the museum, uh, to, to name it the Museum of the Crimes of Communism. And it was, yes, it was remained, yes, it was renamed. Uh, now it's called the Museum of, of Occupation and, and uh, Fight from Freedom, which is more appropriate. So this is one small, uh, small victory, so to speak. One, uh, yes, one Cartago has been destroyed. So um, that's uh, all I can tell, maybe that will give you uh, some uh, um, material for the discussion. Uh, thank you for your consideration. Now I would like to invite our distinguished uh, panel uh, to come up and, and we can begin the conversation. 
the first person I would like to uh, introduce is Saulius Sujedelis, who is Professor Emeritus of History at Millersville University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Professor Sujedelis received his PhD in Russian and East European history from the University of Kansas. He was research historian for the Office of Special Investigations at the U.S. Department of Justice and during 1989-1990 worked as a radio journalist and commentator for The Voice of America. Professor Sujedelis is author of a number of scholarly books and articles on Lithuanian history published both in the United States and Lithuania. Between 2007 and 2010, he has served as director of Millersville University's annual conference on Holocaust and Genocide. In 2013, Professor Sujedelis was awarded an honorary doctorate from Vitautus Magnus University in Kaunas in recognition of his work in furthering the study of humanities in Lithuania and for contributions to Holocaust research. Salis? The, the next person on our panel is Rabbi Andrew Baker, who is Director of International Jewish Affairs at the American Jewish Committee, which he joined in 1979. A leading expert on anti-Semitism in Europe, he travels extensively to strengthen relations between the AJC and Jewish communities worldwide. Throughout most of the 1990s, as Director of European Affairs, Rabbi Baker, promoted tolerance in the emerging democracies of Central and Eastern Europe. He is active in Holocaust restitution issues and in 2003 was awarded the Officer's Cross of the Order of Merit by Germany for his work on German-Jewish relations. And I would like to add one point, that there were, there were actually, when, when YIVO got started on the YIVO Vilna Collections project, which is now gotten great acclaim throughout the world. It was met with fierce resistance. For many of the reasons that Professor Venslava mentioned, it was met with resistance on the part of anti-Semitic groups in Lithuania. But to my surprise, it was met with even more resistance by Jewish Holocaust survivors and by Jewish groups that resolutely refused to work with Lithuanians on any project whatsoever. And it was only a handful of individuals among whom Rabbi Baker was uh, the, 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 the strongest who helped support this project at the beginning, who recognized the importance of this project, who encouraged me despite the personal attacks that I often suffered in not the Lithuanian press, but in the Jewish forward and online for taking this step of attempting to make a collaboration with Lithuanian partners in, in, an, in a project to reclaim a shared history. And so I thank you. I've wanted to thank you publicly for a long time, Rabbi Baker. And it's a pleasure to welcome you onto our stage. The, the final member of, of our panel this evening is Mindaugas Kvitkauskas, about whom a lot can be said both in, in, in Lithuanian and in Yiddish. Um, he is a literary scholar, writer, and translator since the beginning of 2019. Uh, Kvitkauskas has served as Lithuania's Minister of Culture. Before becoming a minister, Kvitkauskas worked at the Institute of Lithuanian Literature and Folklore in, Lith in Vilnius for many years and managed this institution in 2008 to 2018. Kvitkauskas acquired his PhD at the Department of Lithuanian Literature, Vilnius University, and studied Yiddish language and literature at Oxford. Uh, his main areas of research are multinational literary modernism, and urban culture in Lithuania and East Central Europe. 
He is the author of two academic monographs, a collection of poetry, a recent book of literary essays, uh, including uh, uh, his, his books have been translated uh, in, uh, f uh, from the Polish, uh, I'm, pardon me, Kwiatkowskis has also translated several books from the Polish and Yiddish languages, including works by Czesław Miłosz and Ab Avram Sutzkever. And I wish to say that when the plaque uh, to the Ivo Institute was unveiled in Vilnius this past summer, uh, Minister Kwiatkowskis uh, gave a talk in Yiddish uh, to the Lithuanian media. And so uh, 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 Minister Kwiatkowskis is a great force of good, I think, in Lithuanian society, in Jewish-Lithuanian relations, and uh, YIVO is very proud of our partnership with the Ministry of Culture on a variety of projects today. So thank you for coming, and please take your seat. I'm, I'm the moderator. Um, I did. <laughs> uh, so maybe I'll, I'll get this started, but I don't want to, um, to, to, to dominate this in any way. Uh, I think that, uh, that uh, Professor Venslova's uh, introductory remarks raised so many difficult issues, serious issues, and raised them in exactly the correct way. And these are issues about the possibilities of multiculturalism, the endurance of hatreds that, are, that cannot easily be explained. They, they, they have political, social, religious, psychological, uh, uh, economic uh, causes, undoubtedly, uh, historical precedent. And I think I just want to throw open, I was, I was preparing a list of questions, but I really just want to throw open to this panel, uh, both on the Lithuanian and on the Jewish side, how are we going to deal with this? How can we deal with these issues? We are dealing with these issues in America, right now, in Charleston, all over. How do we deal with the past? How do we try to create a world where we can live together and with some kind of mutual understanding? So, Jonathan, if I could, I'd like to offer a, a, a bit of context here. Uh, I'm, I'm not an historian, uh, but it's now actually 21 years ago that I had uh, received a phone call then from Leonard Mary, who was president of Estonia. He invited me to Tallinn and then to join him at a meeting of the three Baltic presidents that took place a day later in Riga. And the reason for that was a discussion on addressing the respective Holocaust histories in the three Baltic states. Uh, I met there Valdis Adamkis, who had been recently elected as president of Lithuania. And at the end of this meeting, the summit meeting of the three Baltic presidents, each one announced that they were creating an international historical commission. It was a way to address the question of Holocaust history. No one, of course, had really been able to confront this history openly and critically after half a century of being uh, under communism. Uh, there was also the decision that in looking at its history, each country would look as well at the history of the Soviet occupation. And uh, this was something that was promoted by the US government, by the State Department. These countries at the time were seeking membership in NATO. 
Uh, it had to essentially be sold in Washington to a somewhat skeptical U.S. Senate. And these were, well, these were among the questions. How were these countries dealing with their past? And for us, of course, it meant that Jewish past and the complicated issues relating to the Holocaust. At the time, I recall Leonard Mary saying, you know, I don't have any historians in Estonia that I can even trust. I mean, such was the nature of historians in the Soviet period. In fact, he turned to a, a, a diplomat in Finland, Max Jakobsen, to create or to cheer its historical commission. It, when it came to Lithuania, there were significant challenges from outside. Uh, we know some of the complications you confronted. Uh, the Jewish community, uh, the Litvak community in Israel, was skeptical of any historical commission, particularly one that was also going to look at what took place under the Soviet period. So that itself led to a lengthy negotiation of a historical commission, but would have two subcommissions, they'd be separate, et cetera, et cetera. And so there were the efforts, and by the way, they were uh, replicated in other countries in uh, the former communist bloc world, because after communism fell, many of them, looking for some sense of national identity, looked back to that period really during the fascist era. And it was not uncommon that figures of that time, people who were active in the murder of Jews uh, were now being rehabilitated, even venerated. Horthy in Hungary, uh, Antonescu in Romania, and uh, Tiso in Slovakia, and uh, as we've seen and we've heard also in Lithuania. It began a long process, and I think at the time we felt, okay, look, it was very hard for Western European countries to confront their own complicity in the Holocaust, and they were democratic states for decades. So it was not surprising that it would be hard for these new, uh, newly independent countries to do this, Lithuania among them. And there was, I would say, considerable progress, uh, a historical commission that brought in uh, scholars from Yad Vashem, of course, uh, Solis was a key figure throughout, uh, to really look critically at this history. And I think we felt, looking back, if you had asked me 10 years ago, there was considerable progress. Hey, yes, there were difficulties along the way, but in balance, it was, it was positive. Now I begin to have my doubts with some of the things we have been witnessing more recently. Again, efforts to revive some of these figures, to pay honor to them, to say, well, if uh, this, uh, this one in uh, Sholai didn't know that by uh, uh, imprisoning Jews in a ghetto and uh, uh, stealing uh, their property that they would ultimately be sent to death camps, then maybe he's okay to, to, to uh, honor for his anti-Soviet activities. And again, we see it in other countries. I don't want to limit this to Lithuania where whether it's backsliding or renewing uh, efforts to honor these figures and becoming a force for right-wing nationalist elements in society. But you know, 20 years ago, if this was happening, we could say genuinely, well, people were ignorant. You can't say that today. And I think that's the particular challenge that we face now. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll maybe start in Yiddish. Just a few words. Es is a grosser Kovet on Fargenigan, Farmir zu sein do in Jivo, zu nehmen ontel in der Dosiker Diskussie, a litvish Yiddish Diskussie. Es is a guter Simon von unser Nonten mit Arbeit. Adank. So uh, many thanks to uh, Yivo and to Director Jonathan Brandt for this great cooperation that we really have in many fields in our studies on Yiddish uh, 
culture, uh, on the discoveries of the Jewish heritage of Lithuania that are really important to uh, our uh, mentality, to our identity, to, to, to the progress of our entire society. Uh, I personally, as a researcher, have a fantastic uh, collaboration with Ivo. Uh, I was do, uh, doing my research here on several locations, on several academic uh, visits. My main subject is literature. I'm a literary scholar, critic, and translator. And uh, actually, I started uh, being interested in Yiddish uh, via literature, via poetry. The first texts of Jewish literature, Jewish poetry that I've read were Abraham Sutzkever's poems written in the Vilna ghetto. That appeared in Lithuanian translation for the first time in 1992. Uh, I was 16 years old, and I, as a teenager, I read an impressive love poetry written by a Jewish poet, Jewish author, about whom I knew nothing before. I knew nothing about Jewish literature before. And I thought I would like to read these poems in original and maybe some day to translate more of that into Lithuanian. So uh, I think uh, this little personal story uh, can also demonstrate the meaning uh, of culture, of literature as a medium of authentic experience, as a medium through which the uh, personal thinking, the personal attitudes might be changed. Well, uh, I have myself uh, experienced and I ha can, can testify this transformation, this, uh, this path from a total lack of knowledge about Jewish history, Jewish heritage, and, uh, uh, and the Holocaust, to the to a feeling of a, an understanding of a multicultural network that used to be uh, very rich in Lithuania, in Vilnius, and in other Lithuanian places, in other Lithuanian uh, cities. This is a transformation, this is a transfer from a void to a network where you feel connected with other people's lives, with other people's histories. I went through this via literature and academic research, but this path also led me to impressive, very important personal encounters Conversation, conversations, exchanges of memories that changed my thinking as well. One of my first teachers of Yiddish language was uh, Ms. Fania Bransovskaya, a Holocaust survivor, a prisoner, and partisan of the Vilna ghetto. And uh, this experience of reading Yiddish poetry by Moshe Kulbach, the poetry, po poetry that she knows by heart since her uh, days at the Vilna Yiddish Gymnasium, and now letter by letter is teaching me to read this is something that then sits very deeply in your mind and leads towards uh, different attitudes, towards different discoveries. So I believe that 
This path is really very important towards widening of awareness. And through this path of authentic encounters, uh, many things could be achieved. Uh, now, I think that the demonstration, the, the, the results uh, of uh, education, of, of new knowledge, of widening of awareness, can be really, uh, 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 really felt in the Lithuanian public space. One of those positive results is uh, uh, changing attitudes of our younger generation. That uh, 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 is, is also uh, uh, clear uh, in the results of our elections. Of our last political elections, the presence of a uh, young electorate was really felt and the choice of a young electorate clearly uh, demonstrated the choice of pro-Western democratic politicians, not the far radical right. This is a positive outcome. I think this is, uh, albeit partly, a result of our changing education, changing cultural discourse. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a question, uh, and maybe, Salius, you can help to answer this. That is, to what extent is the government as an institution and government institutions responsible for these changes the, to, to, to effectuate change? Or to what extent must these changes come up out of the cultural matrix that can be informed by education and the kind of personal contacts that Mindaugas has yeah, described? Um, thank you, Jonathan. And uh, it's quite an honor to be here today uh, at this great institution. Um, I think that the question that Dr. Venslova presented to us, what has changed and what has not changed, is I think the key question here. In terms of what has changed, well, we can see what has changed. If you took, take a look at, uh, in Lithuania, most of this research that goes on about the Holocaust is actually government-sponsored because the History Institute, the universities are all government-financed. In the area of academia, a great deal has changed in terms of what we know about the Holocaust, about Jewish history in particular. Uh, and so there's been an, a veritable revolution in the kinds of academic approaches we have towards Jewish history. Uh, not the least of which is the fact that, as we heard Dr. Kwiatkowskis uh, say, there are not only he, but also there are at least uh, two dozen young Lithuanian scholars who know Yiddish, and some know Hebrew and Yiddish. In a small country of less than three million people, that's quite a bit. Uh, and so that has changed dramatically in many ways. Um, now, uh, in terms of, but if we talk about the social attitudes, so, so the war for history is over in a sense. By history, I mean history as, a, as an academic and as a intellectual construct which has rules, uh, me methodology which is accepted in the Western world as a legitimate exercise and a field of study that changes over time. Now, however, if we're talking about the war for memory in public spaces, well, here we have a problem. And I think to address the whole issue of the past, you know, three things are essential. Uh, the first of which is that Lithuanian society and the educational system as a whole must accept Jewish history as a part of the national narrative. Easier said than done, and I'm a good example of that because uh, I have not studied much of the life of Lithuanian Jewry because most of my research has been about the death of Lithuanian Jewry. And most of the subjects of my research are not the victims but the perpetrators. That came about because of the teaching and research that I did over time and focused on. And now I regret that I did not go back and learn more of the kind of history that Mindaugas Kitkauskas knows quite well. Spend more time at YIVO. Uh, obviously so. <laughs> the second element of this three uh, of the past is that we must see the Holocaust as the central event in the 20th century Lithuanian history. And the historian Elgimatas Kasparavichus, who is one of the, our best specialists on 20th century history, put it recently in a text. He said, look, the greatest tragedy Lithuania suffered was not the loss of independence, 
which if you asked ethnic Lithuanians, they would say, but the destruction of the Jewish community during the Holocaust, because independence can be regained when the right geopolitical circumstances arise, as happened in 1990, but the Litva community will never be resuscitated. I mean, the historical community, you, it's gone forever. And we have to acknowledge this in very specific ways. And of course, the third leg of this approach to the past that I think would help greatly would be that Lithuanians, particularly uh, themselves, must honestly address the issue of native collaboration in the Holocaust and do it in a scholarly uh, and a, a precise way. Now, on the academic level, that's being done. However, in the war for memory in the streets and perhaps in public narrative, it's not so easy. And I think I would like to add one thing, and I do understand that the anti-Semitism does continue, and, and it's there, you can feel it. Uh, but there's also something else that is a problem in terms of the historical experience. And that is the fact that uh, when we talk about a shared history, I'm not extremely optimistic about this because we're dealing with extremely different experiences. Uh, we all know uh, how the Jews remember the Holocaust. This is the tragedy of our history. However, the Lithuanian perspective is chronologically different. Uh, over 90% of Lithuanian, ethnic Lithuanian people I'm speaking of who died violently in the 20th century died after the end of World War II. Try explaining that to a Western audience, it's almost impossible, including some of my own relatives. They were killed after the victory over Germany. Uh, of the about 260,000 or 270,000 ethnic Lithuanians who were subject to Soviet repression, that includes not just killed people, but imprisoned and so on, 90% from 1945 to 1950. So the very chronology of the 20th century conflict is different. And so you have to overcome not only anti-Semitism and the natural disinterest in the problem of the other that is such a human factor, but also this very real split screen of your national past. And, and so I think the best we can hope for at this point, not so much shared history, but the acceptance of the other's narrative as legitimate and getting into the other's narrative and accepting it as something that has to be part of my conversation. Uh, on, on that thing. And uh, one thing I would like to say about this double genocide theory, uh, it would be too much to call it a theory. Uh, it, give it too much respect. It, it's a resentful impulse based on a whole number of different things. But in terms of, uh, because the theory, it, it, it sort of suggests a legitimate academic framework, an intellectual framework, which you can discuss and, uh, intellectually. And, and that's not what it is. This is a resentful impulse uh, of the kind that people feel sometimes, well, why is everybody always talking about the Holocaust, but nobody's talking about our suffering? And I, I would leave it at that. And, and, and I think that with the younger generation, part of that is, is beginning to dissipate, uh, I think fortunately for, for us. Uh, but I have to say, I have to agree with, with Andrew that in terms of our past and trying to solve these problems, uh, what has been happening in the last uh, few months uh, recently is, is, is not encouraging. Um, uh, and hopefully this is, uh, is going to be one of those um, uh, momentary hiccups, I hope, um, because I think that still we have a civil society. Uh, I don't think things are hopeless. Uh, Hungary may be, but I think Poland is still on the edge of being able to pull back perhaps somewhat from where they are. So I think we have to look at it in those kinds. But just going back to my main point here is simply that uh, you know, uh, we, we need those three legs to the historical past if we're going to get to uh, a attitude of some mutual respect for each other's national sort of experience. Uh, and I, I don't know. I, this is I, I made my point simply sort of ex prompto here, uh, something I've been thinking about for some time. Um, I hope it makes some sense. Uh, Thomas is. <laughs> Is there something you would like to add? Because I have another subject that I would like to raise. If, but, yeah, the, you touched on the double genocide, non-theory. <clears throat> I, I should say I try to avoid the term genocide when I speak about these issues, 
except for uh, instances such as uh, the Holocaust, which mm -hmm. was a genocide, and Rwanda, which is probably mm -hmm. the closest analog mm -hmm. to the whole kind of process under which it happened. I simply used the term crimes against humanity to talk about Soviet crimes, mm -hmm. and they were enormous. But, yeah. you know, I, I, yeah. I don't, and, and I object uh, vociferously to any use of the word Holocaust with a small h to describe events which are not uh, the Holocaust of the Jews in Europe. Mm -hmm. But underlying it, uh, underlying a lot of the resentment is something else that has really risen to the surface in Poland, I think in Lithuania, but certainly also in America, and that is Zhida Komuna, that is Jew communism. And I'll never forget when I gave a talk at the Lithuanian Community Center in Chicago and to, to a group of about 150 people. And a man stood up and he said, Mr. Brent, thank you very much for coming. It's very good to hear of all that you are doing. But how can you expect us to be interested in the work of your institute or the destiny of your people when, you, when your people let the Soviets into Lithuania, when your people caused the destruction of my people. So you talk about, about respecting each other's narratives, but how do we respect this narrative and, and, and deal with such a narrative as that? Uh, I think there are narratives that are beyond the pale. And I have to say something, you're absolutely correct. And what the tragedy is that when you look at the public discourse of 1941, very soon after the German attack and invasion, the most successful piece of Nazi propaganda in the Twenya, the most successful form of anti-Semitism was the connection with Bolshevism. Not many people knew about the racial theories. They weren't interested in that. There was only a handful of intellectuals that even knew about them very much, reading Mein Kampf for this. But the Nazi use of the Bolshevik, Judeo-Bolshevik, the Judeo Komuna connection, was a powerful force. And it really, you can see in the activities of much of the society and the narratives that it becomes a motivation for violence. So I think when we're talking about narratives to respect, you take out of the conversation those narratives which are directly responsible for violence. I mean, we don't, we don't need to talk respect in that kind of sense, but we do have to understand it. I think that uh, it, it, uh, as I study it more and more, it, it, and this powerful meme continues. And of course it continues in the diaspora, I'm talking about the ethnic Lithuanian post-war diaspora, uh, because it's a self-justification of sorts. Look, see what the Jews did to us type of thing. Uh, completely ignoring the fact that Jews also suffered under Soviet rule extensively. Uh, and that there was actually an, uh, a Jewish anti-Soviet activities in 4041, ignoring all that. On the other hand, the problem is when you study historical research, and this is a real difficulty, if you look at the documentation of the 4041, when that idea germinates, because the idea of Jewish Bolshevism was alive and well before the Nazis attacked, and it only grew uh, as it developed. It was alive and well in oh, America yes. oh, in 1920. Yeah. Well, see, <laughs> here, and, and uh, here there wasn't even you know, the, the same level of influence. Uh, and, and, and when you see that, I mean, um, it, 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 I can go to the archives and take, we now have the complete membership list of the Communist Party. There's no longer any speculation about what the percentages were of ethnicity within the Lithuanian Communist Party from June 1940 to June 1941. We, we see clearly because all the documents are there. I could take one segment of that year, a snapshot, and then another segment from another snapshot and prove almost anything. And this is one of those areas where historians have a difficult wrote oh, because you have to take the entire picture and, and context into consideration and look at the picture from a little bit further back to get what the real dynamic was. But unfortunately, there are people who take the snapshot and trumpet it and say, look, the proof is, is here. I, I have these percentages of how many Jews were in the Communist Party, so what are you telling me? Uh, and so in, in that case, the, uh, the, the, there are days when you know that kind of research can 
uh, it, it has to be done carefully because, uh, you know, people can misuse genuine archival documents for their own purposes. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's something we have to deal with. Uh, how, how do you deal with these issues at the Ministry of Culture, or how do you think the government can deal with these issues, or, or what steps in education are public mm -hmm. education are possible? Uh, well, uh, we, we steps, uh, uh, these steps uh, uh, were being made, and, and some, of, uh, some of them are, are, are really uh, clear. One thing that I, I can mention that uh, the uh, uh, study on Holocaust literature uh, sources and Holocaust history became a uh, uh, part of the Lithuanian school curriculum. Uh, it is one of the common requirements. For, exa for example, even in curriculum of literature, a common requirement is to uh, be able to analyze the Holocaust literature in the context, in the historical context, uh, context of the Holocaust. Now, of course, in uh, situations of this conflict of memories that Professor Sojedelis and Professor Venslova spoke, uh, uh, spoke about, uh, it is, of course, very important to make the wider public aware about the facts and about the decisions being made. This communication is a crucial issue. We, uh, there is no society free of stereotypes. There is no society free of social aggression, you know. But this aggression can be exacerbated by uh, 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 strengthening of antagonisms and strengthening of fears. A clear communication, clear facts, and the clear positions of the uh, government, of the officials, are really important. I think we have uh, really uh, good uh, examples in Lithuanian politics, uh, starting from the uh, um, official act of apology of our uh, Lithuanian President Brazauskas back in, in, in the 1990s uh, for, for the Lithuanian participation in, in, in the Holocaust. I think that really important, uh, important uh, uh, steps were being made uh, regarding the uh, restoration uh, of uh, Jewish property, of the compensations, financial compensations for the Jewish uh, community. But sometimes we really uh, lack this uh, uh, clear determination, and there is a feeling of the uh, haziness, avoidance of the topics uh, that, uh, of course, uh, can be really damaging. Uh, and uh, of course, as, as, we, as we just mentioned, uh, there is a feeling of resurgence, a resurgence of these nationalistic trends as a kind of a reaction. It's a kind of a reactionary politics towards uh, steps of uh, education, steps of, of, uh, of uh, this, uh, uh, changing of, uh, towards westernization, broadly, uh, broadly speaking, in, uh, in Eastern and uh, Central Europe. The only measure that I see uh, is fervor changing of a public discourse and of a public mentality. And here, media plays a really crucial role. The responsibility of our public media is one of the issues that I think should, should be really fought uh, over. Uh, the present-day journalism, the uh, trying to, uh, to uh, use sensation in these uh, uh, sensitive issues uh, can be really damaging for the public mentality as well. 
Yeah, uh, just to share some of some of my experience uh, in, in this regard, uh, I don't think there are strong profiles in courage in almost any place today uh, when it comes to these issues. So when I speak about Lithuania, it's certainly not to uh, ignore what we see elsewhere and, and in our own country. Uh, I led negotiations on compensation for Jewish communal property. It took 10 years. I mean, we negotiated over three different prime ministers. And in, in Lithuania? In Lithuania. Uh, um, in the end, what was agreed to was a, a payment uh, equal to maybe about a third of the value of these properties, uh, somewhere in the range of $38, $39 million. It's being paid out over 10 years. But every time an election would uh, emerge on the horizon, we would be told, well, we have to, we have to put aside these negotiations. It was not, and I think it's to Lithuania's credit, there really isn't uh, an extremist, nationalist, populist political party. And there's no openly anti-Semitic political party. But there are elements in the mainstream parties of that. And I think there was always this, this nervousness. If we do too much, I put too much in quotes, because all we're really asking for is uh, a proper... Uh, uh, recompense for what was already well understood to have been Jewish property. If we do too much, it, we're going to lose votes. We're, we're going to challenge ourselves. I, I think one of the best people on dealing with all these issues, we became friends over the years, was Valdis Adamkis, was the president. Uh, he was strong, he was correct, but even he, I, I think, was careful about not moving too far. Uh, you, you talk about the, the press, there's a, a very nasty yellow press, at the time, uh, and this now goes back, I don't know, more than 15 years in any case, uh, publishing scurrilous articles, one, a series on how Jews control the world and so on, and uh, this kind of incitement uh, is illegal. And there were efforts made, and a, a public prosecutor, in fact, brought, brought charges against this publisher. And in the course of that, and of course the investigation went on for months, at one point, I was visiting uh, uh, Vilnius. I, I came in, I saw the president, and he was in a very foul mood, and he explained to me that the prosecutor just announced he was going to drop this case. And, and he was upset. He said he's going to ask his aides, see what he could do. The prosecutor <clears throat> is independent, but he's going to try and encourage him to, to, to resume the prosecution. Uh, I said to him, well, I, I didn't hear this news, but what you're saying seems the proper thing. We turned to talk about other issues. And in fact, that day, they issued his office, issued a press release uh, announcing the, the president was calling on the prosecutor to reopen this case. But, but the first paragraph was, after speaking with an American Jewish leader, the president asked this. So in other words, it was though I need to give him cover for him to do the right thing, even though he clearly knew the right thing to do. And so I think there is that kind of nervousness. So when we saw, as we have <clears throat> in, in recent weeks, and, and, and I accept what the minister said, uh, uh, that uh, you know, we may be talking about uh, a relatively small number of people. I mean, a demonstration, as uh, the professor said, maybe a, a couple of hundred people today. But, but you don't hear the strong voices, clear and immediate, to push back on this. Uh, the foreign minister was quite outspoken on the Noriega plaque, but he was, he, he was in the minority. So you look for other voices. I think what's done in textbooks, what's done in schools, and what can be done in museums, and, and we know Lithuania lacks a proper Holocaust museum. It, it, too much time has passed already. This is something that should be done. But, but what public leaders say and do re really can set the tone. It, it can do it in a positive way. And if they're silent, it leaves space for the others. And I think that's what, at least today, makes me troubled. Because I think we do know the people who are in the mainstream leadership know what the right thing is to do. The question is whether they have the courage to, to, to do and to say it. Uh, the 
publisher uh, of a newspaper that you, you, you were speaking uh, about. Uh, during the uh, last years, obviously lost his case because he had to close the paper edition of his newspaper and lost his audience. So I, I think the judgment of the readership was also clear. It didn't come very fast, but the process led to the closure of that newspaper. The second thing uh, that um, Professor Wenzlow uh, also mentioned is the uh, matter about the uh, proper Jewish and Holocaust Museum uh, in Vilnius. Uh, it is uh, really, it, it really has to be established a new, uh, uh, a, a type of a new uh, modern institution. Um, and I can uh, tell that the decision has been already made that uh, the historical building of a Vilna ghetto library on the Strashun Street in Vilna uh, will become a new uh, place after reconstruction where the Holocaust ex exhibition, which is uh, now uh, still very small, uh, will be uh, uh, transferred. And this will be a, a new center for Holocaust studies in Lithuania, this authentic building. And uh, the Ministry of Culture has already started the technical project of the restoration of this building and uh, transformation this into the Holocaust Museum in Vilnius. Um, did you want to say something, Thomas? No? Uh, maybe we should open this up for questions uh, from the audience. Now, uh, if you have a question, please come and get the microphone that uh, Alex Weiser will provide. Hello, I have two questions. The first is about the speakers on today's panel and why uh, no one from the elected Jewish Lithuanian community was invited to speak. And my second question is about the proposed civic convention center on the site of a Jewish cemetery and whether YIVO is going to speak out against it. So, uh, as for why no one from the Jewish community in Lithuania was invited to speak, simply, we we can't invite everyone, uh, let me put it that way. Uh, second, um, it was by no means, I think the implication of your question is that they were being purposefully excluded, and they are not, from this conversation. But um, uh, I, I think it would be un, a bit unwieldy to have more than four people on this stage. Um, and as for YIVO's denouncing policies of the uh, uh, Lithuanian government, YIVO <clears throat> is not a political institution. We do not advocate uh, against uh, particular policies. I have had discussions with um, members of the Jewish community in Lithuania about this issue, and I understand it's an extremely complicated one. Can I say something yes. to this issue? We're talking about the <clears throat> Schnippischke Cemetery. Um, I, I frankly, here I think the Lithuanian government actually deserves credit. And, and uh, I think there's a distorted picture that out there, and frankly, it's, it's passed itself around repeatedly uh, on the internet and in different Jewish sites and so on. There is a Soviet era sports center that was built right on the cemetery. Obviously, it was done when there was no control, no concern uh, on the part of uh, a Soviet government. Uh, surely many, many uh, graves were disturbed when that, was, when that happened, and, and that's a legacy that the current government has. 
Uh, there were the, the, the property itself at one point, going back now some decades, was, was sold. There was a private developer who had all sorts of plans. And there was a, a legitimate outcry. A, at that point, the government ultimately stepped in and effectively bought back the property. Th there was some construction that took place, new apartments on the border of the cemetery. Some uh, controversy or debate was this actually over graves or only uh, adjacent to the cemetery. There were different, there were different borders. Uh, after that, uh, with, with outside encouragement, I want to say uh, by American Jewish Committee and other groups as well, uh, the Lithuanian government consulted and entered into really a formal agreement with, with someone who's perhaps the most uh, authoritative uh, rabbinic voice when it comes to the preservation of cemeteries, an ultra-Orthodox rabbi in London, Eliakim Schlesinger, who chairs the Committee for the Preservation of Jewish Cemeteries in Europe. And they've been a partner to the government in, in the discussion of what to do and how to, how to deal with this, this tragic situation. You have a building that's abandoned, you have a cemetery around it. Uh, the, the, there are plans to renovate it. The choices are few. And I think the, the, the rabbis themselves believed that to actually remove the building may disturb more graves, uh, more, 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 more bodies, than, than leaving it alone. So the idea of removing it or keeping it it is not a clear-cut picture. There's no real good solution. There, there was an agreement that the building would be renovated, that would be overseen in the whole construction process by uh, these rabbinic authorities, uh, that there would be no new work done on the site, that the remainder would be clearly identified as the cemetery it has been, uh, as a kind of a garden with memorial inscriptions and other things. It seems to me in an awful situation, and this is far from unique in this part of the world. M many uh, former Jewish cemeteries or Jewish cemeteries uh, no longer used that, that uh, have become sites for building and other things. So in this case, the Lithuanian government, and this goes back now a decade, uh, recognized that it would only address this issue with the full involvement of halakhic authorities. So I think people need to understand that. You, you may disagree on what they suggest as the solution, but it's certainly not ignoring the very real concerns that, that Jews may have. gentlemen for your candid discussion and comments. Uh, I just wanted to add, I think that there is perhaps one hopeful solution to all of this, and that's education, specifically with regards to educating younger Lithuanian boys and girls about uh, Lithuania's history and its appalling history towards its Jewish citizens. And perhaps through a proactive movement by the government, that perhaps these stereotypes can be in some way undone, perhaps not completely erased. And I think that the government needs to make a concerted effort, like the Germans have done, to really move ahead with this and be more proactive. Two other points that I just wanted to make before I stop is I was curious to know from gentlemen about what the role of the Lithuanian church is at the present time in all of this, which hasn't been mentioned. And my last point is, what is the current uh, issues, or what is the current feeling among Lithuanians about the, the state of Israel? Okay, can I just mention a few things about the church that I know of? I'm not a specialist in this, but. Uh, some years ago, I think it was in the late 90s, there was a formal statement by the Lithuanian Bishops' Conference uh, regretting the participation of Catholics, Lithuanian Catholics, in the killing and the robbing of Jews, and it was public. Uh, 
And there have been some public statements of the right kind that uh, Rabbi Baker mentioned, you know, they don't say the right thing. But aside from that, um, not much uh, from the church. And neither then, during the time of the killings, nor right now. There was only one publicly expressed condemnation of the killings in 1941 by the Bishop of Telche, Justinus Togaitis. That's it. Uh, all other things were sort of sotto voce, or the regrets announced in private, which of course had absolutely no effect on the, uh, on the killers at the pits. Um, so I would like to really emphasize a point that uh, Rabbi Baker said about political will. It is extremely important because in 2016, on the 75th anniversary, there was a remarkable public demonstration in the town of Molete, inspired by a playwright, Maris Ivoshkevich, uh, who wrote a beautiful essay which went viral. And two to 3,000 people showed up to commemorate the Jews of Mulete, embarrassing the politicians who decided to come also uh, and be there because the people showed up. And there are other smaller such remembrances. There's been a monument now in Yurbarkas. There was uh, a, a local initiative and also the Shedova the Museum by the son of uh, Grigory Konovich, which is being built. But you see, these initiatives will wither on the vine if there is no political support at the highest levels. That's at least my opinion. And that's why that is so important, that the politicians do develop a spine and say things in public uh, that need to be said and take the heat uh, uh, when they say that. So uh, I, I may uh, just add that uh, there's going to be a next uh, March of a Living on the 23rd of September this year uh, at Ponar in Vilnius. And uh, we will be able to test what you have just said. I am taking part in that march. And just one, one quick word about education. I appreciate the point. The problem is it is so difficult to quantitatively measure the impact of curricula. We have now sent 400 teachers over some years to Yad Vashem for seminars uh, every, every summer for two weeks or so to get educated on issues, to learn uh, teaching materials to come back and it's just hard to measure the impact uh, quantitatively and so we just don't know how successful that is. I'd like to correct some issues but I did want to say that um, the efforts of the Lithuanian government to establish a bridge to the Jewish community is very much appreciated. Uh, I've spoken to a number of people the mayor of Lithuania was here. <clears throat> we had some good conversations. But there are elements which are very, very distressing. Uh, there were two apartment complexes built in the cemetery. Uh, one of them was built in 2005 and one in 2007, 2008. We have yet to be told where the tons of human remains and skeletons were dumped. We want to rebury them. And the Lithuanian government is simply not interested. We've had uh, promises. We've had reassurances. It's never happened. So that's an element of bad faith, which we feel is not consistent with all of the conversations we've heard tonight. The other point I wanted to make is that, with all due respect to Rabbi Schlesinger, who is a very, very uh, respected uh, rabbi, uh, he's practically alone in the world. Virtually every other Orthodox Jewish rabbi, every leader, the chief rabbis of Israel, everyone's opposed to the desecration, the further desecration, defilement that which will recur, making this, this, uh, the, the sports palace, the Soviet sports palace, into a concert and convention center. That's not appropriate for a cemetery. Even if there were not going to be further uh, incursions in the cemetery itself. So uh, I don't know whether you can be a, me a, 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 a messenger, Mr. Minister, but there is distress all across the world over this impending project, and we hope it'll be stopped. Thank you.
Can you hear me now? Okay, thank you. <laughs> My name is Elliot Matz, and um, I actually think I've met or spoken to some of you individually, but um, Professor Susie Delis um, mentioned, I believe it was you who said something earlier about um, there's a, there are places in existence and there will be in existence where people can go to learn about how people died, but there aren't very many places to go to learn where, where how people lived. And um, I think maybe some of you know that I've made it a project of mine to um, work at the existing open air museum at Rumschuskus, also known by my grandfather as Rumschuschuk. My grandfather emigrated from there to Boston, um, which is a beautiful museum, but doesn't at this point adequately depict um, the real life uh, coexistence of the Jews and the Gentiles in a market town. Um, and I am working with the Ministry of Culture. I met with your staff over the summer. And um, I'm meeting with Jonathan Brent uh, later in October, and uh, et cetera. But working with people in Lithuania to try to add on to the museum at Rumshuskas so that it does have an accurate portrayal of uh, what we would call a shtetl. Um, and I think almost every school child in Lithuania goes to that museum at some point during their education. And um, I strongly feel, and I'm pretty sure you guys do too, that it's the museum which every kid goes to should accurately show how Jews and Gentiles lived the fraught relationship that they might have had, but also the cooperation that they had. And I'm also hoping that that new part of the museum will have some kind of educational and cultural entity associated with it to study how people lived and coexisted for <laughs> hundreds of years. And maybe we can learn something from it and apply it to this for a world that we live in now. A great idea, really, really. It's, it's really important. And uh, or another project that is also being realized in Lithuania is a, a museum uh, uh, of uh, uh, shtetl uh, in Shadova, uh, Shadeve. Uh, it's a really private initiative uh, and uh, privately funded. That it will be also an, a unique example, I hope, of a reconstruction of, uh, of a shtetl life in an exact, authentic place. And um, I have been to Shadiva as well, and I think it's a wonderful place. But what's different between Shadiva and Rumshuskas is that Rumshuskas is the, the colonial Williamsburg of Lithuania. In, in Rumshuskas, people will be able to interact live with reenactors who are living the life that people lived in the late 19th century. Um, I think they're both wonderful uh, movements. Okay. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm very impressed by such a learned uh, erudite panel and so it takes a, a bit of nerve for me to address you. But I'm going to, because you encouraged me by your conversation, by the variety of points of view, background, and that you have something in common here now uh, that you're discussing. So I'm encouraged to ask a couple, I, a couple of questions that I have, having heard you. I heard about the political will, the power of the political will, as, as evidenced in uh, the development of communism and fascism, 
which could be looked at as totalitarianism, and uh, that when people suffer under totalitarianism, uh, it's difficult to see how, how powerful that actually is. That's one of the characteristics of that particular kind of movement. Uh, so the idea of a split uh, history might be looked at in that way. I wondered if, if that is something you might be interested in discussing as well, totalitarianism. And the other thought I have is about humanism. Uh, another ism, but one that's much more appealing to me and much more optimistic. I'm concerned about being too caught in the generalization as opposed to the particulars and that those things also seem to go into a conflict. The very general view, the very particular view. And how do we find our way within all of that? Those of us who are concerned about these issues because they show up again and again and again in many different histories. And so my overall question, I think, is are you optimistic that cultural beliefs, cultural humanism, the things we do have in common, our humanity, in fact, can outweigh the political side which is very powerful, very aggressive. This is what I've heard. And are you optimistic that that can be overcome? May, may I uh, say one word? In, in 1919, I think it was, Thomas Mann wrote that he had no love at all for liberal democracy but that it was German culture that was going to rein in the terrible impulses of the state. German music, the legacy of Goethe and Schiller and, and all of the great philosophers and Kant. And he was bitterly disappointed when he discovered that German culture, perhaps the greatest European culture of its time was unable to do that. And so I, I always think of what Mann wrote and his tremendous disappointment uh, when, when this subject comes up because I do think that political, economic, historical factors can overwhelm culture. Can I just one brief comment to that? I've, uh, all historians think about these things. We don't just sit in archives and look at details, um, but as human beings, we have to take a wider view. I have to say that one of the things I've learned that is quite depressing in terms of uh, optimism is uh, learning that situations can sometimes cause people to behave in ways they would never otherwise think of behaving and the power of the situational, well, the situation itself. And uh, you can see all these totalitarian regimes come about in times of crisis and when people begin to behave confronted with things they had never confronted before. And uh, you see that uh, particularly how fragile sometimes these situational relationships are between national groups, between uh, myself and the other. You know, uh, the destabilization of these long-held communal relationships can collapse very quickly, as we've learned in the 20th century, and whether it's India, Pakistan, whether it's Rwanda, whether it's Sarajevo, whether it's Lithuania itself, uh, a country which had a relatively stable social system until 1940, uh, and then comes unglued, and, and there's nothing to stop it. Um, you know, my answer to the optimism question is simply that uh, you have to do what you have to do regardless of what outcome happens. I mean, as any human being, morally and ethically, I think we're bound to behave in ways regardless of we, whether we think we'll succeed or not. And that may be the only answer I have, and I'm sorry if that sounds somewhat glum. Uh, 
Well, speaking about the opt about optimism, I many times I repeated uh, one uh, saying that there are optimist and there are at least two kinds of optimist: an optimist as such, and a historical optimist. The optimist as such says everything will end well. The historical optimist says, everything will end well, but I will not live to see it. <laughs> then, when I once presented this, this saying, I, I am generally a historical optimist, but I have seen some things I never hoped to see in my life. For example, independent, uh, relatively prosperous, and relatively enlightened Lithuania which I never hoped hope to, to see in my life. I, I thought, maybe my grandchildren will see it, maybe not, but not myself. Then, well, there was also a Lithuanian scholar whose name was Professor Shilbayoris, who once also said something very, I, I think, very profound. Uh, that He said, I, well, he, he was a Catholic, although probably not a very much uh, pra of a practicing Catholic, but this is a secondary question. But he, yes, but he said, I prayed all the, my entire life, uh, Lord, prolong my life, prolong my life. I want to see uh, free Lithuania. Uh, the Lord, who is uh, incredibly, just much more wiser than myself, he did something much better. He did not prolong my life, but he fastened history. Uh, he, made, he, did, he made history more fast. But so, such things happen. Uh, but um, when I uh, presented this distinction between the, an optimist and the historical optimist, in a group of Ukrainians, one Ukrainian uh, writer told, and I, that means Ukrainian writer, I am an apocalyptic optimist, which means everything will end well, but nobody will live to see it. <laughs> <laughs> so that, So you see, it's a very, very difficult problem, very difficult problem. So uh, I also can uh, speak about this famous and a bit banal uh, parable of Sisyphus Stone. Uh, I felt more than once that the stone we were pushing upward kept rolling back down. and the anger and hatred that we were trying to drive out of our psyches could erupt over and over with increasing force. But the stone has to be pushed over, uh, just to, to be pushed upward. Uh, I don't think that this is emotional, emotional rewarding, like Camus put it, but, uh, but I suppose it is necessary. Uh, well, one of the very important things for, uh, well, you said much about education, about uh, the difficulty to evaluate the um, results of the education and so on. Uh, yes, it, I hope, I can only hope that it works very, very gradually, but it does work. Um, for example, now, Notwithstanding the, um, all the bad things in Lithuania, there are much more sober voices than it was 20 years ago. Much more sober voices in Lithuania concerning the, the, the events of 1941 and so on and so on. But the, the main thing is not education, not factual education. It is uh, empathy, promoting of empathy. An understanding that this other is uh, the same sort of human being as myself, which not everybody understands, that should be instilled in people from the very early childhood. 
and this is the just the main uh, just the main education that should uh, take take place. If it is done, then we have uh, some some base for some basis for the moderate optimism. You know, uh, 40 years ago, I was at a White House event. This was when Jimmy Carter was president that was meant to be a summit focused on the challenges in the Soviet Union. And it brought together activists uh, in the Jewish world uh, pushing for uh, refuseniks to be able to leave the Soviet Union. There were also uh, the various uh, free Baltic state organizations that uh, were there, and I can recall at the time, in fact, looking at each other, you really imagine there's going to be one day a free Latvia, a free Lithuania? Uh, could we hope maybe Jews would be able to leave in some real numbers from the Soviet Union, but that was really the, the, the aspirational goal? And then 10 years after that, the, the Soviet Union collapsed. And, and so, what resulted was a free Lithuania, a free Latvia, uh, freedom uh, now for these countries that had been under the yoke of the Soviet Union, uh, the right, of course, of Jews to leave. A and many, I think, thought that's now exactly what they would do. They could go to Israel, they could come west to America. But you have revived Jewish communities, some very small, but you have revived Jewish communities in all of these places. I don't think anyone could have imagined that would happen. And the revival was so successful that in many places, Lithuania being one of them, you don't have only one community, you have two, and at least uh, they have to fight with each other to show you that uh, they really are authentic Jewish communities today. So in a way, I think there is reason to be optimistic when you see this, even if, for the moment, and I'm not looking in the far distant uh, future, even for the moment, there, there are still uh, concerns we have and, and doubts we share. I'm afraid that's all we have time for tonight. I know there are a lot more questions, but we have a reception with some wine and food outside, so we can continue this conversation in the hall. Thank you so much to everyone.